We began the series last week called Blast from the Past, and uh, we're, we're looking at various Bible characters, people that lived some 2,000, 2,500 years ago, and looking at how their lives of faith demonstrate great examples for us. Our anchor verse is found in Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter dealing with the subject of faith. And the author of Hebrews says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. So we're looking at some of these people from days of old and seeing how faith played a part in their lives and what that could mean for us today. Now, uh, in regard to the anchor verse, I just want to make a few opening comments. The author here says that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. Some of your translations may say something like, faith is the assurance or the confidence of things that we hope for. So the author of Hebrews had certain hopes that he shared with his readers, right? That there were some hopes that he was looking forward to. And he says, faith is the confidence that these hopes may one day be realized. Now, what were those hopes? I think, first of all, he had the hope that Jesus, who died on the cross and rose from the dead, would fulfill his promise to come back again, right? And he placed his hope in the return of Jesus Christ. He had hope that sin and death, disease, pain, poverty, injustice, all of those things that riddle our world would one day, once and for all, be destroyed. And he had hope that even after he died, even after this physical body was destroyed, that he himself would share in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and would live forever. That's what he hoped in and what he hoped for. And he says faith is the reality of that which we hope for. Faith is the assurance. It is the confidence that I have for what I hope for. So faith, faith is the assurance of these kinds of things. Even though for, for, for the person who wrote the book of Hebrews, everything looked like it was opposite world, right? I mean, it looked, instead of like Jesus was coming back soon, it looked like Jesus was taking an awful long time to return. And, oh, by the way, here we are now 2,000 years later, still waiting for that same return that he was waiting for. He had this conviction that Jesus would ultimately fulfill his promises. And so over the next few weeks, we're looking at uh, various characters in the Bible uh, who lived thousands of years ago who demonstrate for us and whose stories survived because of the faith that they placed in God. Today I want to talk about how faith informs our decisions. So my first question, I guess, would be, does faith inform your decisions? Do you sit in here? Uh, do you ever, when faced with a decision, contemplate how that decision should be informed by your faith. We could be here, and I'm sure there is a cross-section of people kind of living in various places in regards to, uh, to, in, to faith. Uh, there are some who perhaps have been followers of Jesus for many, 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 many years. Uh, there are people that uh, have begun following Jesus recently. There are some who aren't following Jesus at all, right? So we have this spectrum of faith. And, uh, and you may sit here and say, well, my faith is really strong. You may say, my faith is really weak. But the question I have for you today is, how does your faith, regardless of where you feel like you kind of fit in on that faith spectrum, how does it inform your decisions? How does it make a difference in the daily choices that you make in your life. How many of you know that we all face hard choices? We are all going to come across choices that are going to create some conflict and turmoil inside of us. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, I started working in a restaurant. I, was, I had this great desire to cook. I loved cooking, and so I, I accepted this job to become a cook at, at a very nice restaurant in New Hampshire. And the first day I went there, um, they were getting ready to serve a couple hundred plates in a banquet hall. 
And so the executive chef who hired me uh, told me, he, he told me, he said, stand here and when the plates come, take these garnishes and garnish the plate and then pass it onto the serving tray. So I was kind of the last step in that process. And so the meat was placed and the potatoes were placed and the vegetables placed and somebody ladled gravy over everything. And then it came to me and I had to throw the, the garnish on there and I quickly realized that I was not as fast as everybody else in that kitchen. Right, so the plates were piling up. I'm doing my best. Everybody's yelling and screaming at me. But we got through it. It was great. And after it was all over, what happens in the restaurant is after that kind of rush, things are just, there's like, everything's done for a while, right? You've served a couple hundred people. It's over. And now there's just this, ah, right? And everybody's high-fiving. Hey, we did it again. And uh, I felt like I was part of the team. And uh, so shortly after, I said to the executive chef, I said, well, what's next? And his eyes veered from me over to the area of the dishwasher. You want me to wash dishes? I, yeah. Oh, man, that was humbling. I, I, thought, I thought I accepted a job as a cook. But, you know, when you're 16, 17 years old, you just do what you're told to do. And so I went and started washing dishes. And, and I washed dishes, and I washed, I washed, I mean, I, I washed my heart out of those dishes. I just, I, I did the best I could to keep everything caught up. I constantly found myself, you know, caught up and, and the area clean and looking for something else to do. And because I did that, I was given other responsibilities. So it's like, oh, he doesn't have any dishes to clean. Let's let him cut some vegetables, right? And so I started doing some prep work. And eventually that led to more and more responsibilities. And it was great. It was a great experience for years of my life. But I do remember this one time, kind of in the beginning days, that uh, it, uh, it didn't go over so well with the other dishwashers. The cooks loved it. The cooks loved it when I was working, but the other dishwashers weren't crazy about it because I was doing too good a job. Have you ever been in that position before? You know, where there's other people you're working with that just kind of want to maintain status quo. I remember walking out to the dumpster. We're, we're out dumping, you know, heavy barrels of trash into the dumpster, and the sky fill. And yes, I say that pejoratively. This guy, Phil, he says to me, he's like, hey, you're making us all look bad. Now, I was 17 years old at the time. You know, he was uh, 30 years old, something like that. He was an aspiring musician. Uh, so he's there. He's a full-time dishwasher. I, I was just working part-time. But that, that was kind of his career at the time. You're making us all look bad. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, slack off so that you don't look bad? I you know, so I had this decision to make. Am I going to just try to kind of go with the flow and be like the rest of the crowd, or am I going to look for ways to set myself apart? Later on in my experience there, I was given opportunities to wait tables, right? And so I got to put on a fancy tuxedo shirt and a bow tie. No, I don't have any pictures of that. Um, they've all been destroyed. But uh, So I started waiting tables, and after a couple of weeks, a waiter, a uh, professional waiter, like a real professional waiter, came to me and got in my face and said, hey, are you claiming all your tips on your paycheck? I said, yeah. Or I, you're not supposed to do that. Well, why not? Well, because it's making us look bad. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Is, you know, do what you want to do. I, I, you know, I, I think I have to do that. Like, that's, I'm obligated to pay taxes on the money that I make. And so he's like, well, you know, that's, the, the government's going to see that there's this disparity between what you're claiming and what we're claiming. We're going to get in trouble for it. And so, again, do I go with the flow or do I try to do the right thing? So we face those kinds of decisions, those hard decisions where we find ourselves at odds with the people around us, right? And sometimes what we feel like we know we're supposed to do, what we feel like is right, is sometimes different and contrary from everybody around us. Think about the days when you were back in school, right? And there was that kid that everybody kind of picked on, Right? I remember in elementary school, there was that kid, Booger Nose Brian, his name was. <laughs> Boy, that name will stick with you. And I only point that out because I'm embarrassed to say, like, I never stood up for that kid. Like, here I am, you know, many, many, many years later, just feeling like a coward because I never stood up for him. But he's, like, we, we've seen that kind of thing happen, right? We've seen kids get picked on and bullied, right? Ostracized for, you know, maybe some, at some point in second grade, this poor kid picked his nose in class. Somebody saw it, and he had to live with that for the rest of his life, right? Those kinds of things happen. Some people are born into racism, right? Some people are born into families that are, that are racist, that think that other people of different cultures, of different skin types, are actually inferior to them. And because they're born in that racism, they grow up with that racism as part of their identity, right? And it's very difficult for them to break away from that prejudice and see that all people are equal, 
in value. For some people in the world, their religion is chosen for them. Right? They're born into some religion, and, and to, to go against that religion down the road in their lives could mean ostracizing themselves from their families. For some people, it could even mean physical harm and death, right? Because their religion was chosen for them, and, and sometimes a choice to abandon that thing, a choice to go against what the crowd is doing can be very, very difficult. The other kind of hard choice that we're often forced to make is the choice that, gets, that goes against our own desires, right? So we have the choices that other people make for us, the choice of how we're going to work, the choice of how we're going to treat other people, the choice of how we're going to uh, worship God, right? So some of those choices are made for us, but then there are these choices that we have that sometimes go contrary to our desires. Have you ever wanted something that wasn't good for you? few of you, yeah? That happens occasionally, right? Right? So, so we're, we're faced with this choice of whether to give in to that desire or to abstain from it because we know that it's not good for us. And we talk about teenagers, right, and their raging hormones, right? I'm going to embarrass all the teenagers here today, right? And all of a sudden, their bodies are creating these desires in them, and they have choices to make about what they're going to do with those desires. Some people would say, hey, you know, just go with what you feel. Go with what you want to do, right? Other people would guard and caution against that and say, hey, listen, you're going to make choices here that are going to have consequences for your life. So tread lightly, my friend, right? We have, we have choices that we have to make that sometimes go against our desires, even natural desires. Sometimes we make a bad choice with our money because we wanted something so bad. We knew we couldn't afford it. We knew it was irresponsible. But the desire to have it outweighed any of those cautions, any of those guards. And so we gave in and we bought it. We paid the price for it. Sometimes we intend to only eat a few handful of chips. But all of a sudden the whole bag is gone. I knew that wasn't good for me. I know that I'm not going to feel good after. But boy, did it feel good going down. Right? We give in to those desires. Think about all the people that live with addiction. You know, just this inability to, to, to choose restraint over desire, right? There, there, there's some dependency on something, or, and, and it's just, it's, it, it just feels like it's impossible to break free from those chains, right? Because the, the addiction is so strong. The desire for, for that thing is so difficult to break free from. Well, there's a guy in the Bible that I want to look at today. His name is Daniel. And Daniel had some hard choices to make in his life. Uh, Daniel's a person that all of us are going to be able to easily identify with because he was perfect. He was very wise. He always made the right choice. He always did the right, right? Everybody identify with that kind of guy? Yeah, right? He's kind of our hero, right? Yeah. Daniel had, his life was, his life was full of hard choices. Now, um, let me just introduce him to you for a second. Now, Daniel was, uh, was considered to be of noble birth, right? And, uh, and he lived in Israel when the Babylonian Empire conquered Israel. And uh, this decree went out to go and get young men, the best and the brightest, right, of the nobility, bring them to Babylon so that they could be assimilated into the Babylonian culture, so that ultimately they could help provide authority and rulership even among the Israelites, right? Because the strategy of conquering empires was instead of just killing everybody, which didn't do anybody any good, let's subjugate them, let's assimilate them, let's make them like we are so that they can provide benefit to the empire, right? It's much better for Israel to be producing, for Israel to have a blossoming economy because you can tax that, right? And the empire be can, can become more rich. That's better than just setting the whole place to fire and destroying everybody altogether, right? So there was this desire to assimilate, to bring in, uh, not to perpetuate Judaism. I mean, the goal wasn't to, to help Daniel uh, extend his religion in the Babylonian empire. It was the opposite. They wanted to assimilate him into Babylonian culture. And so, so Daniel is this young exile who's been ripped from his homeland, is now living in Babylon. 
He served under King Nebuchadnezzar. That's kind of where he comes on the political scene. Right? Nebuchadnezzar has these dreams that nobody, nobody's able to tell him what the dreams were or the interpretation. And so Nebuchadnezzar gets fed up with all these magicians and sorcerers and wise men. And he sends out this decree to destroy them all. They're useless to me. They can't tell me what my dream is. Why do I even have them around? Get rid of them. They're a bunch of jokers. Right? But then somebody says, hey, there's this guy named Daniel. And he said that he can tell you the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel goes before Nebuchadnezzar, does all that, right? And so that's in the first few chapters of the book of Daniel. So Daniel is elevated to this place of prominence. Well, Nebuchadnezzar comes and goes. And then Daniel actually survives a handful of other rulers of other kings until ultimately the final king is defeated by a whole other empire. And that's where we pick up on Daniel's story here. The Babylonians were conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, and King Darius came to rule, and Daniel now was serving not only a different king, but a whole different empire. And so we pick that up in chapter 6 of Daniel. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each pro province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and to protect the king's interests. So again, here's the strategy of the Medo-Persian Empire is now to divide the land into manageable chunks, right? To put a governor who has the king's interest in mind, uh, put him in charge of that little chunk or that little province. And then those 120 governors reported back to three, one of three men, either Daniel or one of these two other guys that kind of served at Daniel's level. Well, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. And because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. You know what Daniel was like? Daniel was like that city worker who actually does something with the shovel that he's holding. You know what I'm talking about? You're driving around wondering, why does it take that many people to dig a hole? Why does it take that many people to do this or that, right? And there's, there's always one guy working and 14 or 15 other guys just kind of standing around looking, thinking how great it is to be getting paid to watch the other guy work. Well, Daniel's the guy with the shovel that started digging the hole, right? And Daniel started to set himself apart from these other jokers. And guess what that meant? It meant Daniel was going against the status quo, the status quo that had been established, the status quo that everybody was kind of happy and comfortable with. I mean, think about it. He had been given this great privilege, this place of prominence. He and two other guys, they were in charge of the whole empire, right? That was going to give them authority. That was going to give them wealth. That was going to give them influence. That was going to put them at the king's table. How great it was for each of these. Even the governors, those 120 governors, I mean, they all were given their little piece of authority, right? Their own little kingdom to rule. And, ah, oh, here comes Daniel, that goody two-shoes who does everything right. He's going to upset this whole thing, right? Because how many of you think, like, seriously, how many of you think that among those 120 governors and these other two high officials, that they were doing things by the book? Like, what are the chances are that they were ruling with justice? That they were ruling well? That they, that they were ruling with integrity? No, I mean, they were given these positions. And uh, I'm sure for many of them, they took advantage of those opportunities. They benefited wrongly because of those opportunities that were afforded them. But not Daniel. Daniel ruled differently, and it started to make a difference in the eye of the king, right? And so the king had made plans to place Daniel over the entire empire. Well, so the other administrators and the high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn, right? So these guys, they're nervous about how their authority is going to be diminished when Daniel's authority is expanded. Right? If Daniel becomes greater than we, if we become responsible to, to report not to the king, but to Daniel, our, our authority, our privilege is going to be diminished. And, and, and worse than that, like, Daniel might make us do things his way. And so they looked for a way to get rid of Daniel, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. And so they concluded, 
our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So we can't find anything wrong with the way that he administers, with the way that he leads, the justice that he rules with. There's just nothing for us to lay against him. There's no charge that we can bring against him. You know, it's like they so badly wanted to bring him before the high court and say, see, this is what Daniel's doing. Accuse him of something and get rid of him. But they couldn't find anything wrong. Wouldn't that be great if that's what could be said of us in our workplaces, if that's what could be said of us in our schools? You know, I look and look for something to criticize this person for, but I can't find anything wrong with them except, man, they got some funky, weird religion. They got some funky, weird way of living their lives that, man, I just, maybe we can find something wrong there. That's, that's where these guys found themselves with Daniel. Daniel followed after this religion. You see, he hadn't assimilated into Babylonian culture. He hadn't assimilated into Medo-Persian culture. Daniel continued to practice faithfulness before God. Daniel continued to seek after the one true God. He didn't give in to the idolatry, to the plurality of religion that, was, that, was, that marked this empire in which he ruled. He had figured out in the midst of kind of everybody else doing their own thing, how to stand firm for what he knew was right. And he did it in a way that it didn't bring offense to the king. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? In fact, the king loved Daniel. The king recognized he needed Daniel. It was only these other people whose, whose lives were being threatened, whose authority was being threatened, that wanted Daniel out of the picture. So Daniel's faith, we find him here now, conflicts with culture. Right? That's, that's kind of the reality of what they set up here. They say, we're only going to be able to find fault with him in regards to his religion. We've got to find some weird thing about the way in which Daniel practices religion, and that's how we're going to trip him up. Because Daniel's faith conflicted with culture. You know, Daniel could have, when he was brought into Babylon, he could have maintained some semblance of Judaism right, but otherwise conform. That would have been the path of least resistance. And for you and I, that's something that we're often tempted to do. You know, we who are trying to pursue what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, which is a radical way of living, you and I are tempted every single day to conform to the patterns of this world rather than follow hard after Jesus in the way in which he wants us to live. That's where Daniel found himself. Right? At odds with culture, at odds with the government, at odds with the people around him. And Daniel could have said, hey, you know, I'm going to make some minor adjustments, but otherwise still be kind of Jewish. Just like you and I can sometimes be tempted to make some minor adjustments so we can blend in with the rest of the world and yet still be kind of Christian. We live in a society that today wants to take control of our choices and our way of thinking, right? They, the, the world has this desire to control the way people think and what people choose to do. You say, well, why would that be? Why would anybody care? I mean, I live here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I live in the good old U.S. of A. where we are free to to worship however we want. We're free to say whatever we want to say. We're free, as long as we don't hurt anybody else, to do whatever we want to do. What does that mean that there's anything or anyone out there that's trying to control or influence the way that I think? I just, I don't want to get deep into it today, but I want you to be aware of the fact that that exists for a couple of reasons. Number one, and I say this at the risk of weirding some of you out, because it weirds me out a little, Number one, um, Satan, this evil angelic being, seems to exist. Right? So we're introduced to this character in the Bible, and he's called Satan, he's called the devil, he's called the deceiver, he's called the accuser, he's called a number of things. But there appears to be this being, this entity, who is not only singular, but apparently has others that are part of his realm and dominion. And he has been given some level of authority over the earth. Now, 
I don't know how that all works. I don't like to think about it. I'm not going to get into heavy, angelic discussions with anybody because I think that the, it's all very inconclusive. But Jesus, who died and rose from the dead, appears to have recognized the reality of the existence of some devil. And this being, again, for whatever reason, is motivated to do everything he can to keep you and to keep me and to keep all of the world from experiencing all that God has for us. That God created us in his image and he created us to have eternal fellowship with him. And Satan so hates God and Satan so hates what God has created and Satan so hates what God has called good that that motivates his dominion to do everything it can within its power and within its authority for a period of time to deceive people into thinking differently from the way that God wants them to think. To choose differently from the way that God wants them to choose. Again, I don't know how all that works. I just, I just want us to kind of recognize that that at least probably exists out there. Okay, this unseen dimension that has influence in our world. Right, so the Bible, the Bible talks about this dichotomy between uh, the pattern of God and of godly thinking and the pattern of worldly thinking and that those two things are at odds with one another. And you and I choose under which pattern we are going to lead our lives. All right, so there's that. Um, so let's say you want to just put that aside. Say, I, 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 you know, forget the devil. And that, that's fine because the Bible tells us that we are imperfect, sinful beings, not because the devil makes us do anything, but because we give in to our own desires. We are enticed by our own desires. We give in to those desires. And in doing that, we sin against God, right? The Bible says that's kind of the, that's kind of the source of our sin. So hopefully we can be at least okay with that. And then how many of us would recognize if, if the devil and his dominion doesn't seek to have influence over us, there are at least people in the world who stand to benefit or stand to gain something because they can get you to think a certain way or they can get you to choose a certain thing. Would you all agree with that at least? Okay, so the rest of you have never watched television, <laughs> right? The rest of you have never seen a commercial, right? The, nev the rest of you have never been advertised to. Oh, right, like, the, how many of you ever seen a, a, a Pepsi commercial or Coke commercial? What are they trying to do? They're trying to influence our behavior, right? Pepsi's trying to convince us that to drink their product means, A, you're going to be less thirsty, and B, you're going to be more sexy than if you drink the other kind of thing. <laughs> and listen, I don't mean to be polarizing today, right? I don't mean to, like, separate, you know, the left from the right here, but in my opinion, Pepsi is far more sexy than Coke. It is far better tasting, and so... <laughs> If you're on the fence, not unsure, just unsure of which way to go, go with Pepsi. It's the better product. No, like we're, we're constantly bombarded by people that are trying to influence our buying choices and other choices beyond that, even beyond just commerce, right? That exists. I, I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to get into how it all works. I just want us to recognize that we think we are free thinkers. We think that we are left to our own devices to kind of think and to act, you know, completely sovereign and independent from any influence out there, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a strong, independent thinker, and I do what I want. That's what we like to think about ourselves. But we are bombarded day after day from the time that we, the, from the time that we are, are gain consciousness as a being, right? We are influenced by our parents, and then we go off to school, and we are influenced by the educational system, and then we are influenced by the university, and all along the while, we are influenced by advertisers, to make certain choices and to think certain ways. So don't think for a second that you're a strong thinker just kind of living in a vacuum without the possibility that anybody's trying to get you to think a certain way. 
How many of you recognize that even the church has done that over the years, right? The church wants to get us to think a certain way. The church has, has had the strategy of trying to, to gain loyalty among its adherents by forcing behavior on them, by saying, this is what you are to do, right? And, and they add to what the Bible says other things in order to control people, right? To make their choices and their decisions for them, right? To, in essence, take choices away from people, to disregard the fact that we are volitional beings, that exists. Now in the modern church growth movement, we've decided, hey, you know, that's not really good for attendance numbers, right? That sometimes erodes attendance. Man, we're, we try to beat you controlling, and so we've swung in the other direction, and we've disregarded choice in a completely different way by saying that choices don't matter. Like, hey, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you think. We're all welcome here, right? It, you know, it's, it's just kind of a free-for-all. And I think the truth lies somewhere in between those two things. We live in the society that wants to control your choices and your way of thinking. So the administrators and the high officers went to the king and they said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into a den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. And so Darius signed the law. So their strategy was to bring Daniel into conflict with the laws of the land because they knew if they had this law put in place, they knew there's a good chance Daniel was going to carry on with his pattern of behavior and even go against the decree that was made, and then they'd have him. And it says, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. And so here's where we bring the flannel graph into place. Right? So here's Daniel. Right? There's Daniel. Looks just like Daniel. And um, we're told that when the decree was made, uh, Daniel did like he was normally accustomed to doing, which was praying three times a day. All right, I broke that. So there's Daniel's bed. <laughs> Workmanship just isn't like it used to be, you know? I, we have quality control. All right, so there's Daniel. He's at his home, right? He hears the decree has been made. And instead of adjusting his pattern behavior, the Bible tells us that he goes... And he kneels down, as usual, in his upstairs room with the windows open, and he prayed to God three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. So how did Daniel handle this conflict? You know, in his entire professional life, Daniel was constantly bombarded with a society that aimed at re-educating him, of tearing down his faith and making him conform to culture. And Daniel, time and again, and here we find him again, instead of giving in, and conforming to culture, he continues to be faithful to God. And what's his reward for that? Well, the Bible goes on to say that, that, that these, these men who had come against Daniel went to the king and they told him, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. And hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, king, we're with you, man. Like, that's such a bummer. Like, we love Daniel. He's such a great guy. But he broke the law. What are we going to do? I mean, you signed the law. You've got to enforce the law. You don't do that. What, what, what's going to be next? And so, at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And so... The king says to Daniel as he's thrown into the den of lions, may the God who you serve so faithfully, may he rescue you. And so now we find Daniel no longer praying, but arrested, rewarded for his faithfulness to God by being thrown into a den of lions. In case you're wondering, this is what you look like when you're thrown into a den of lions. Bible says he's a great man of faith, right? I mean, he's just, he's not worried. You know, we just got a kitten recently, an orange cat. We named him Leo, like Leo the lion. 
he looks more ferocious than these lions here do. But uh, Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, and the king says, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. And then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out of the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? I find that fascinating. Darius' whole reaction to this thing. First of all, he spends all day trying to figure out a loophole to get Daniel out of this predicament. And when that doesn't work, he's ultimately left with having to cast Daniel into the den of lions. And he goes back, he refuses the usual entertainment. Like normally, he'd go home, turn the TV on, watch an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond, and then he'd go to bed. But not this night. This night he stays up fast. He cannot sleep. He's so worried and so anxious about what's going to happen, Daniel. And yet, doesn't it seem like even in Darius, there's like this glimmer of hope that maybe Daniel would be okay? I find that fascinating. And I think we have to consider the impact that Daniel, over the course of his years, the impact that he had on Darius' life. Isn't it amazing that Daniel had so lived his life that Darius had become a person, maybe not of faith, but he was at least curious about God's faithfulness. At the least, he was curious about whether or not this God that Daniel served so faithfully, whether or not that God was faithful. So Darius was curious about God's faithfulness. Daniel was convinced of God's faithfulness. I don't think Daniel went into the lion's den completely sure of what was going to happen, whether or not he was going to be rescued or he was going to be torn limb from limb. But he goes into the lion's den. It's interesting. Daniel doesn't really say anything when he's thrown in there. But now here's Darius, you know, coming back. Daniel, has your God saved you from the, from the lions? And so remember this guy from last week here. Right, that's, our, that's our angelic being. Um, angels always stand this way, apparently, in every Bible story. Uh, right? And so Daniel says, yes, the Lord sent his angel. And... Um, he shut, the, he shut the mouths of the lions, and I'm unharmed because God recognized that I did nothing to offend him, and I've done nothing to offend you, my Lord, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and he ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den, and not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. And then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Let me, get the, let me go get those pieces. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Apparently they don't make those pieces in the flannel graph set. But, uh. So why do we have this story in the Bible? Like, What's the point of all that? I'm going to let you choose today. We always try to arrive at some point. I'm going to let you decide what it is today. Is it A, if you're faithful to God, the bones of your enemies will be crushed by lions? Is that the point of the story? Is it, listen, always read the fine print before you sign any contract. Is it that lions are, in fact, very lazy animals? Or how about this one? Faithfulness needn't compromise. Despite the temptation to do so, to, despite the temptation to go with the flow, to conform, to follow after the pattern of this world, to give in, faithfulness needn't compromise. So what does faithfulness look like to us today? We're reading about a guy that lived 2,500 years ago. What does it mean for us here in 2018, living in a culture that has its way of thinking, in a world that has people, minimally, and perhaps even some angelic dimension trying to influence the way we think and the actions of our lives. What does faithfulness look like for us if we're trying to pursue what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, one thing that I don't think faithfulness looks like is perfection. Like, let's just get that out of our heads right now. Faithfulness is not perfection. Now, the people couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel, but I guarantee there was something wrong with him. 
right? Because no one has ever lived in this world excused from sin and the nature of sin and what sin does to us. Every one of us is subject to it. None of us are perfect. So let's get out of our minds from the very beginning that faithfulness has to in some way look like perfection because it doesn't. Faithfulness is not without its fears and doubts. You know, we think that to be faithful to God means that we, we go into everything and we go into every decision without any fear whatsoever, without any doubt. Because to have faith in God means we're supposed to put all that stuff aside. I want you to know today that Daniel lived with fear. Daniel lived with doubt, as we all do. And faithfulness does not require that we be completely devoid of fear and doubts in our own lives. You know what else faithfulness doesn't look like? Faithfulness is not immune to danger. Faithfulness doesn't mean that everything is always going to be all right. That everything is always going to go like it's supposed to. That we're always going to be rewarded for doing the right thing. How many times did Daniel in his life do the right thing and find himself at odds with other people? Even though they couldn't lay anything against him. There's no charge that could be brought against him. How many times did Daniel find himself at enmity with the world in which he was living, and yet he continued to stand steadfast in his faithfulness to God? So what does faithfulness look like? Well, I think, first of all, it looks like consistency. Not perfection, but consistency. Daniel could have made some simple changes in his life, right? When that decree was signed, Like, Daniel could have closed the windows. You ever think of that? Daniel, close the bloody windows before you pray. Like, don't give up on prayer, but, like, do you have to do it in front of everybody? Like, Daniel could have closed the windows. He could have prayed more discreetly. He could have done it in such a way that he was still doing what he felt like he needed to do, but without jeopardizing his own safety. But you know what? Daniel, he didn't do that, and he didn't do that because he felt like to change the pattern in which way, in in the way he did things, would have been an offense to God. For him, it would have meant to offend God. If I shut the windows, if I change the way in which I pray, which I believe is 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 tantamount to how I am I I am faithful to to God, if I change that. If I hide that from other people because some king has signed some stupid law, then it's like I'm I'm proving myself unfaithful to God. Like I'm I'm putting the law before God. I'm putting my own safety and my own life before God. And so Daniel wanted to live consistently. That's why the Bible says he went and he prayed three times a day just like he always did. Faithfulness for us today, it's not perfection, but it's consistency. It doesn't mean that we're perfect every day, that we get it right every day, but there is some kind of consistency that marks our lives. I think faithfulness also looks like our having the ability to make the hard choice. You know, when our desires are contrary to what we know we ought to do, the ability to choose what we ought to do over our desires to make that hard choice. When sometimes we're tempted to just go with the flow, right, and not make any noise, not make any waves, but just kind of go with things as they are. I think that to be faithful to God oftentimes means to go against those things, to stand steadfast and to be who God wants us to be despite the way in which the world is going. You know, for Daniel, early on in his life, it meant that he abstained from the king's food and wine. When he's first brought into Babylon, the the Babylonian king had set a portion of, of food and wine from his own table for all these young men because they wanted them to be well nourished. For three years, they were going to be re educated in philosophy and government and all these other kinds of things so that ultimately they themselves would become Babylonian. And Daniel knew that that would be an offense to God for him to eat that food and drink that wine. And so he begs, let us, let's just eat vegetables and let us just drink water. See if God will, will, will allow for that nourishment to, 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 uh, to, to sustain us. And, and so, so Daniel, from, you know, for all of his life, was constantly facing these hard choices. And then I think finally that faithfulness, what it looks like is it looks like an emptiness of self. It looks like us, you know, 
doing our very best to put God first in everything, to put him and to give him the preeminence that he deserves in our lives, to say, God, I, I, I want to do the best that I can in the decisions that I make, in the way in which I live my life, to put you first in all things, to take into consideration what I think you want for me and not just what I want for myself. I think faithfulness looks like us emptying ourselves and putting God first, and then not only that, but putting other people before us. of putting the interest of other people before our own. I think that's what faithfulness looks like. And I think that that kind of faithfulness is the kind of faithfulness that is both quiet and loud at the same time. You know, sometimes we think that religious faithfulness means, you know, shouting and screaming at the top of our lungs. Repent, you sinners, and be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We think that the louder we yell, the louder that we preach, the more effective that we're being. But I think Daniel's faith illustrates for us that faith is both quiet and loud at the same time. And I want, I want to have that kind of faith. I want to have that kind of faith that quietly undergirds and strengthens me to make the most difficult choices in my life, even when those choices don't seem to have any bad consequences. Even when I feel like I could get away with something or that nobody would find out if I do this or that. I want, I want for, I want for my, my faithfulness to God to, to undergird and to strengthen my ability to make the right choice in even those situations. And then I want that faith, not the, not just, not the preaching of my words, not the, not, the, not the vocabulary that I'm able to use when I'm talking to somebody else, but like Daniel, I want, I want for my life to reflect what faithfulness to God looks like. So what does that mean for you? Like, where is it in your life that you know you could, you could better demonstrate what it means to be faithful to God? What area of your life would you just surrender to God today and say, you know, I'm just, you know, I've been kind of weak in this thing, and I, I just, I want for the Spirit of God to come and undergird me and to give me the strength to do a better job in this, because I want to be faithful to God. I don't want to conform to the pattern of this world as I've been accustomed to doing, but I want to radically follow Jesus, whatever that means. You know, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, and I close with this, that the impact of our choices is real in this world. The way in which we live our lives does make a difference. He says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it, Jesus says. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You are the salt of the earth. You are. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Urging us, don't conform, don't become like the rest of the world. But be salt and have saltiness. Be light in the midst of darkness. Understand that there is a great impact that your choices and your life can have in the world around you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we pause for a moment. We just pray that you, would, that you would just seal into our hearts the example that Daniel has set for us today, this example of what it means to live faithful to God. And Lord, for, for each of us in this place today, that's going to mean a variety of things. And so I pray that you would just help us to recognize First of all, that, that in our choices and the way in which we live our lives and the way in which we think about things and view things, Lord, that you want to have an influence and a say in those things. And Lord, you so desire to give us the strength that we need to be faithful to you, to surrender ourselves to you and what you have for us. And so, so Lord, I pray for that power and that strength in my own life. I pray that for everyone that's here today. I pray for those, Lord, that just find themselves struggling day after day to be consistent in their faithfulness to you. They, like they're, they're dying for it. They're hungering for it. They're longing for it. I pray that you would just, that you would raise them up, God. You would bring them and establish them. Put them on that solid rock, God. Give them sure footing in their lives. Help them to understand that there's an immeasurable amount of grace at their disposal that reminds us we don't have to be perfect that faithfulness is not perfection. And so, Lord, when they find themselves stumbling, when they find themselves giving way, I pray that you'd help keep them from giving up, 
But Lord, let them again turn to you. Let them again climb that rock. Let them again find that, that firm footing. Let them find shelter in you and in your strength, God, and help them to, to continue the next day living with that consistency of faithfulness to you. I pray that you would just reframe our minds, our way of thinking. Help us to see things the way that you see them. Help us to be strong and courageous in the choices that we make. And Lord, I pray that through all of that, what could be said of us is that we are radical followers of Jesus Christ, radically dedicated to living a life that is faithful to God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.